it's okay. Indeed. Uh, hello, my name is David Malin. I'm the instructor for Computer Science E1, Understanding Computers and the Internet. Since you're watching this video, you're actually well on your way to understanding computers and the internet already. But as you brought this video up on your screen, you stopped to wonder exactly how the bit that comprise this video are getting from Harvard server to your computer. And you stopped to wonder exactly why the movie is sometimes jittery. Well, good evening. Welcome to Computer Science E1. My name and his name is David Malin. This is Lecture 9, Security Continued. And this is, as you've heard, the video iPod. Apple was kind enough to send us a video iPod with which to develop the remaining lectures on the course. Um, and surprisingly, it works pretty well. Right? So I've sort of moved up in the world from the sketchy guy in the Apple store who's doing this uh, in the Cambridge Side Gallery. I can now do this in more private venues, but I brought this tonight and I installed on it a number of the videos from our podcast so that you could all take a look. So what I'll do in a moment is pass the iPod around. For the moment, I will lock it on play mode just so that everyone can see it actually working and not um, and say some broken form. Um, but then we'll pass it around again. I'll unlock it so that you can play, touch all the buttons you want, pull up a game, and just generally pass it around through lecture tonight. And there's a little set of headphones, too, if you want to actually hear the sound. So here we have Ray's part of that particular introductory video. The things you should note is besides the, the brilliant imagery that's coming across is also some of the more technological things, of course, so the splotchiness that uh, Ray seems to be evincing here, and he doesn't evince in person. The splotchiness that I seem to evince, too. So think about some of the issues we've talked about in our multimedia lecture, like compression, interframe, intraframe. Because on a medium like this, which we've tried particularly hard to compress so that you can fit these videos into small devices and have them download quickly, we really did have to sacrifice some amount of quality in order to have the videos be a reasonable size. And recall from last week, I think I said that we got two hour lectures to be just 200 megabytes, which is actually pretty remarkable considering that it's two hours of content. Um, but you'll notice that even though we've sacrificed some quality with some lossy compression, you can still, and I'll cue it up for one of the actual lectures, actually read quite legibly what was on the blackboard at night. And I think that's sort of our yardstick. If you can read what's on the board on a screen this small, then I think we've done a pretty good job with the compression, even though we've saved a good amount of space. So once you, uh, if you've never, how many of you have never used an iPod before? OK, so this will be a fun experience. It's actually wonderfully simple. The essence of the interface for the iPod is that you can hit the menu button to go back or to go to the main menu, and then pretty much left or right, and then you can hit play and pause. But the cool thing with these newest uh, iPods is that to scroll up and down, what you do is roll your finger to the left or to the right, and it's touch sensitive, like a laptop's touchpad. The only buttons on this device are the four different buttons, top, bottom, left, right, of this scroll wheel and the scroll wheel itself, in addition to this center button. And then there's this lock button on top. But otherwise, it's a wonderfully simple device. And I will go ahead and queue up, let's say, lecture one, which was hardware. I'll plug in the, micro, the uh, headphones here. Do the headphones have to be attached to continuous play? Yeah, because I know my iPod will stop if I pull the headphones on. Ah, OK. So if you disconnect the headphones, what happens? It does, by design, tend to pause. The presumption being if something comes loose while you're carrying this thing in your pocket, you don't want it to keep on playing. So if you notice that if you pull it out, it, won't, it will pause in this case. So actually, it looks like that's a good point. What I'm going to do is. Just make sure you leave the headphones attached so that the video does not pause. And if you have any questions or concerns about having just broken our 60 gigabyte iPod, just um, catch Ray's attention or Roman's attention, and one of them will run over and hopefully reboot it for you for the next person. So feel free to poke around. And for now, go ahead and just leave the settings alone so everyone can see it live, and then we'll pass it around again. And you can play to your heart's content over the course of tonight. Um, a couple of exciting things coming up, as always. We have, in this week's sections, a focus on disinfecting a PC. So you'll actually get your hands dirty with a discussion and some hands-on activities with spyware and viruses and worms. And we'll again whip out some of our own equipment. And also, we've invited a number of students to bring in their own laptops, if they wish, for 
uh, more of a, a, an even scarier hands-on demonstration. Coming up this Saturday is a fun workshop that we've, uh, we're offering this semester for the first time, the title of which is Digital Photography. So there is a huge movement in the world now toward um, digital photography. And I mean, I even saw on CBS just today disposable video cameras, which I think is sort of a, an offense on some level in the first place. But for $29.99, you can buy some sort of digital disposable camera that you use once, and then presumably you connect to your PC or you mail it somewhere to get a CD back, something like that. But I think the takeaway, besides the disposable nature of these things, which is perhaps somewhat distinctly American, is the fact that the technology has gotten so cheap and so fast that you can actually do these on fairly inexpensive devices. So coming up this Saturday, then, is a workshop on digital photography. Among the things you will do with Dan at the helm, Dan is quite an aspiring photographer. And if you go to his personal website, you'll see many more photos than I'm about to show you. But he's quite the fan of both optical and digital photography. And what I asked his permission to do tonight is just to show you a few photos that he has taken over the years, what you'll do in this workshop this Saturday is pretty much learn all there is to know about digital photography, what the cameras are all about, what you might want to look for when choosing a camera, how you could go about printing photos, how you would go about transferring photos from a digital camera to your own PC or to a CD, really much just a crash course and everything you might want to know about digital photography and what it might be able to do for you. And some of these photos, they won't look as good on this projector, but if you look at them on a sharp LCD or CRT, they really are beautiful. And this projector doesn't do them justice. And all of these are Dan's particular work. And I'll defer to him for the URL of his own personal website. But the beauty of digital photos is that even if you do end up spending, say, $300 or $200 up front for the digital camera, the marginal cost of taking a photo is pretty much zero. And these days, the greatest advantage to someone like me, frankly, of digital cameras is that the things are so small, small to the point where you can actually fit these things, as you've probably seen in your pocket, which for me as a tourist is by far the most compelling feature of a camera, the fact that I don't have to lug those things around on your neck anymore. And granted, my camera is of much lower quality than Dan's. And if he brings it in, you'll see that Dan has a somewhat large camera. But with size, you get even more power and capabilities. But that's certainly not necessary today. But inside of digital cameras, there's a type of memory these days. What kind of memory do most digital cameras store photographs on? Yeah? Memory stick is one sort of marketing-oriented term for it. A memory card is sort of a synonym. These are sort of just the buzzwords that surround the general type of memory known as flash memory. We've talked about USB flash drives, AKA jump drives, AKA USB sticks, those little devices, one of which I brought last week, that you can plug into the side of your computer and then immediately have access to 256 megabytes or even a gigabyte or more these days. Well, in digital cameras today, there are flash memory cards of some sort. Sometimes they're long rectangles. Sometimes they're square-like. Um, square-like uh, cards that you slip into the computer. That's perhaps the only nuisance today, is that a lot of different vendors use different types of flash media, as it's called. But for only 15, 20 bucks, you can buy what are called flash card or flash media readers, which are just inexpensive devices that have several different slots on them. On the other end, you have a cable that goes into your USB port. And essentially, what you then get with these devices is compatibility with sometimes 9 or 12 or even 15 different types of flash memory. So these days, it's not even such a big deal if the camera you get doesn't have the same kind of memory support that another camera has, because it's so easy to nonetheless get the data off and onto your own. A typical memory size in cameras these days are what? How much flash memory does a typical digital camera have, do you think? 512 what? Units are always important, right? Yeah, megabytes, yeah. 512 megabytes, even a gigabyte, or 256 megabytes. When I go away, I think I have a, you know, it's so, it's so sufficiently big, I don't even really know how big it is. I think it's 256 megabytes, maybe 512 megabytes. And I come home usually with, from a trip with 
400 photographs you know, from just a few days of being away. Now granted, about 398 of those will never see the light of day, but it cost me nothing to take them. And so in short, I think you'll have a lot of fun, particularly if you've never delved into this world of digital photography before with Dan's workshop this weekend, or even if you're not local or not available to simply dive into some of the notes that he will be putting online. Yeah. What is that? Uh, a flashcard reader. A card reader. Many different names for it. And sometimes you don't even need such devices. You can just plug your camera into your computer directly with a Firewire or a USB cable. All right, any questions before we dive back into the somewhat scary world of security? Dan's a great person to talk about. I can give you a quick two-sentence answer. Part of most digital cameras is the ability to zoom. Most of them can zoom up to 2x or 3x factors. Um, beyond that, most cameras also offer digital zoom up to 20x or 30x. Frankly, I don't even understand why they use it. Digital zoom essentially creates I, sorry, this is more than two sentences. Digital zoom creates that effect that you see in TV and movies where the police are trying to zoom in on a license plate and all they have is some cheap camera that photographed a guy going through a light, for instance, at a red light, and they zoom in and it gets very splotchy, splotchy, splotchy. Well, in the movies and TV, all of a sudden they just push a button and it becomes crystal clear. Well, in the world of digital photography, there is no such button. So you can zoom in 20 times but all it does is get splotchier and splotchier. So looking for a good optical zoom is what's key. And I'll defer to Dan for perhaps a more expert opinion. Digital zoom is not useful at all. It's just a marketing thing, but a good question. Any other questions? I'm sorry? Oh, it's a good question. What, in what file format are digital photos stored? JPEG is quite common. TIFF is another common format. Uh, raw is another file format altogether where pretty much you just store raw bits, many of them for each pixel, saying what color that pixel should be, similar in spirit to a bitmap. But JPEG is quite popular these days. So all the innards of these things are quite familiar to you already. All right, well, la while last week's lecture was meant to be a bit frightful and scary as to all of the threats to your privacy and security, we just spent 10 minutes talking about you. Uh, with that said, um, we spent last week talking about the threats to your privacy and security. Well, tonight is about some of the defenses that exist. And we'll um, interle interleave into this lecture discussion of some of the topics from last week. But generally, please consider this lecture in particular an opportunity to ask any and all questions that come to mind, particularly as this is one of the most um, important or, dare say, interesting topics that we explore in the course because it's so personally important to so many people, keeping their data and personal information um, intact and secure. Well, scrubbing. Scrubbing or wiping is sort of the counterpart to a topic we spent a good amount of time on last week. And you even walked home with an article about what does it mean to scrub your data or your hard drive? To go over it, clean it out, good, but be a bit more technical. Yeah, that's pretty good. To overwrite your existing data with random data of zeros and ones. So that's exactly right. To scrub your data or to wipe data means to literally overwrite it. Because we've heard many times in this class that when you delete, quote unquote, a file, that's sort of a misnomer, because you're not actually deleting the file. What are you only deleting, usually? Right, the reference in the file allocation table, or the equivalent, so you're simply unlinking the file. You're losing track of it, but the bits that comprise that file are still very much on the hard disk. And we saw last week with our little forensic demonstration that it takes just seconds with the right software and the right hardware to recover, for instance, the course's syllabus, which you saw me delete and then empty the recycle bin on. Well, scrubbing means to go one step further. Not only do you erase the entry from the file allocation table, but you also overwrite the data itself. Now, for the most part, for most people, and for most uh, security purposes, it probably suffices to just overwrite those bits with 
all zeros or just random data. However, there exist standards today, perhaps the most popular of which is a Department of Defense standard, which says to write data seven times over previously existing data, where you have a known pattern of zeros and ones that is to overwrite your original data six times, and then on the seventh time, you actually overwrite the data with truly random data. And using different options and different programs, you can go one step further and then, for instance, zero, as they say, the whole hard drive or the file, so that you see in the end the example like last week when I showed you one hard drive which I had pre-wiped before class. Recall that it was all zeros. And that is truly um, a drive that's been wiped in the most um, robust sense. And it is pretty much folklore, uh, su uh, supposition that folks like the NSA, with enough time and enough money, can actually recover data when it's been overwritten seven times. It's even conjectured that you can probably not, without great difficulty and cost, recover data that's been overwritten just once. In short, if you took some time to read through that article by Simpson Garfinkel last week and perhaps download some of the software with which you can wipe files and scrub your own hard drives, you'll see lots of different options. And among them will be what level of security do you want, the trade-offs for most people like us is that the more times you wipe the data, the higher the level of security you choose, the longer it's going to take for your data to be scrubbed or wiped. So it's really a trade-off between security and convenience. But for typical usage, most any one of those products that is not buggy is more than adequate. And that was the catch, recall. Not all of these products are perfect, which means you don't really want to put your trust in any such software unless you've read some reviews and done some research, say, on the internet as to which of those programs are really recommended by experts and professionals. Questions? Yeah? OK, good question. OK, when is scrubbing useful for a layman? I would say that if you ever get rid of a computer, whether you sell it or bequeath it to someone else as a hand-me-down, it's probably in your interest if you have data that you just don't care for anyone else to ever come across, even if it's fairly innocuous data like old essays, to scrub the entire hard drive. And the software I would recommend for erasing an entire hard drive is a freely available product, as most of our linked software is in this course. It's linked on the software page as of last week under security. And it's called, somewhat uh, intriguingly, Derek's Boot and Nuke. With that said, be careful with software like this. Because do read over the directions on a web page like this. What the page will allow you to do is download either a floppy disk image or a CD-ROM image that you can then burn to a floppy disk or to a CD. But thereafter, you really have a very dangerous piece of software sitting on that floppy disk or that CD-ROM. Because the design of this software, if you then boot your PC with that floppy or that CD-ROM, is to wipe the entire hard drive. It doesn't do selective wipes. It wipes the whole hard drive. So even I, you know, savvy as I like to think I am with things like this, even I am paranoid when it comes to wiping disks in my computers at work or at home. And so even I, for instance, will open up my whole computer. And if I have multiple drives in there, multiple hard drives, I will physically unplug the ones that I don't want to wipe, just so that I don't goof late at night and make a, 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 an expensive mistake. So in short, don't leave floppies and CDs with wiping software lying around the home if you don't want them accidentally booting in your computer. But this is a wonderfully solid program with which to wipe whole data. If you are, I mean, frankly, a lot of people install software like it's a program called Window Washer. Um, other programs that that article last week mentioned, those are not for wiping whole hard disks. By contrast, they're meant for wiping certain subsets of your data, your cookies your temporary internet files. Even at the district attorney's office, we'll often see folks who don't really know anything about computer security, but knew enough to go spend 1995 on some program like Window Washer to install it on their computer so that you essentially cover your tracks pretty automatically when it comes to what websites you're visiting, maybe what else you're doing with the computer. But again, you know, um, a caveat emptor, sometimes those programs are buggy, you know, which is good for us in the DA's office, but not so good for the person doing the scrubbing. So do your homework and research products like that before you use them and put your trust in them. Yeah? When you brought 
Does it remove your drive recognition? What do you mean? Ah. Excellent question. When you wipe a hard disk like this, you're pretty much not only zeroing all the data, but you're restoring it to its original factory condition, small white lie, but that's essentially the case, which means that there is no longer any partition on it. There is no C drive, there is no D drive if you had multiple partitions. So if you want to now use this hard drive, with most operating systems, it's actually as simple as just putting your Windows XP installation CD in the computer, booting it up with that hard drive, that wiped hard drive in the computer. Windows XP's installer will realize, oh, you have an unformatted hard drive here. Would you like to create a partition? Would you like to format that partition? So it's not a problem. But when you wipe a disk, you do get rid of all such structures like the C drive and so forth. It all goes away. Good question. Yeah. OK. Um, recently, I've been hearing about the Sony CD. Ah. It was called that. Um, Sony actually had a program that would put in logs in our computer hard drive, and they could actually um, check what, what size we go or what kind of music we like and stuff like that. Yes. Um, so I haven't followed this thread too closely, but the story essentially is that Sony was caught recently red-handed, as they say, with having installed what's called DRM software on people's computers, where DRM is the jargon these days for digital rights management. Um, it, you might also see this described in the articles as a rootkit. Essentially, with some software that many people were installing with Sony products, they were installing this software that essentially gave them unfettered access to your computer. And this was not disclosed, is my understanding, in the little agreement that people signed or didn't sign when installing the software. I'll have to look into the specifics of this particular case, but they got slammed in the media, because, particularly by privacy um, enthusiasts, because my understanding is that they did not inform people of what they were doing and were simply giving themselves too much access to a user's machine. But I'll follow up perhaps via email on that so I can give you more technical detail. But it is germane to this topic at hand. Other questions or comments? No? All right, the iPod's making its way around, so it's almost time to play on round two. Another defense. Well, this topic came up last week, and I said we'd spend more time on it. This firewall is a term that most of you probably even heard before coming into this course, even if you didn't quite know what it meant in the context of information technology. So this picture kind of gets the point of a firewall across. Right? In the real world, 20 years ago, before computers had firewalls, buildings had firewalls, particularly in strip malls or in buildings where at least good developers had the foresight to install firewalls between units. So that if you had a restaurant next to a little boutique, and that restaurant had a grease fire, and the whole restaurant went up in flames, ideally, the neighboring units in that same building would not go up in flames. So a firewall in the conventional sense is the fire retardant wall that simply blocks, ideally, the passage of flames from one unit to another. Well, in the world of computers, a firewall is sort of similar in spirit in that it's meant to prevent passage from one side of it to another. But it's clearly a more, technical, uh, more technological, a more advanced technique than just mere bricks in the bricks and mortar world. Well, in more technical jargon, what is a firewall in the world of computing as you understand it? Good. Good. It prevents information from flowing from one network to another. So typically, companies today will have a firewall protecting their LAN or their WAN. Essentially, a firewall is usually installed between the whole internet and some smaller network. Those of you with home routers, a few weeks ago I said that these routers, it's tough to slap one label on those devices, the Linksys devices, the Netgear devices, because they are routers slash firewalls slash proxy servers slash DHCP servers slash kitchen sink. Like they literally have all of this functionality wrapped into one, and usually on the shrink wrap box, the company will just call it a router or a home router or an access point. But they do so much more these days. Well, one of those, uh, pieces of functionality is this act of firewalling. And as Peter said, it does prevent, essentially, flow of information from one side to another. But a more interesting query for tonight is, what does that allow you to do? 
Well, with a firewall, a company could, for instance, prohibit users from using instant messaging. In other words, you might have, sitting at your desk in your office building, the ability to send email to anyone in the world, thus going outside your own network with your emails. You might have the ability to access any website you wish. But if you pull up AOL Instant Messenger, or MSN, or Yahoo Messenger, you might get some error message saying, could not connect. And that's because many companies do, in fact, block such services as instant messaging. The question for us, though, is how? A firewall is a device that sits between your LAN and the rest of the internet. How do you think technologically companies are prohibiting you from using certain internet services but permitting others? Yeah. They know the port. So we've known for a while now that all internet services have associated with them some port. So HTTP is the language that web browsers and servers use to communicate, and that's known more numerically by what port number? 80. So these are essentially synonyms. This is the human readable form of this number. This is just a convention that HTTP is associated with port 80. It's simply a number that a bunch of folks a while ago decided would be the standard number for HTTP. But it was arbitrary. What about something like uh, SSH? What port does that use? Bit more of a trivia question. 20, uh, not 16, higher than that, 22 is in fact the case. What about SMTP for mail? All right. 25. 25, and we'll do one more, HTTPS, which recall is the secure equivalent of HTTP. This one's a bit trickier. Anyone? 443? That is, in fact, the answer. Now, every internet service, including FTP, including instant messaging, including Skype, including um, you know, Napster and peer-to-peer -peer file sharing programs, almost all of them have one or more standard ports associated with them. At the end of this course, if you can remember 80, let's just say, if you can remember 80, you're in good shape, which means as of tonight, it sounds like we're already in quite good shape. And I say that because it's not so important to know these numbers unless you are the administrator that needs to be savvy with these kinds of details. So as you suggested, to block traffic from leaving a network, say that on the left, and entering the internet, all you have to do in this so-called firewall is watch all of the TCP IP packets that are going from one side to the other. And if you ever see a packet that's destined for port number 123, if port 123 is the AOL Instant Messenger protocol, all you simply say is, nope, this packet may not go any farther than the firewall. And the packet is, quote unquote, dropped or ignored. Well, similarly, can data be restricted coming in? In fact, if you have Verizon DSL in some areas, you cannot, for instance, connect from, say, Harvard to your own computer, even if your own computer is running a web server or your own computer has like a TiVo behind it that you want to access, or your own computer has uh, Windows um, Remote Desktop installed. For those of you who have seen it, Windows XP allows you to connect to a Windows XP computer from another and control it. Well, you can't do this on a lot of Verizon, um, Verizon DSL connections because they essentially firewall incoming traffic, so you can't connect. This is true even of Comcast and of Harvard and of a lot of universities and companies. They pretty much restrict most incoming traffic. The reason being, they don't want home users, for instance, or Harvard undergraduates running servers in their dorm rooms or in their homes. It's fine to initiate connections outwardly, but they don't want connections coming in. Because if you're running a server, they don't want to charge you $19.95 a month. They want you paying for a host or some level of service that's more than that, essentially. <laughs> They also don't want the bandwidth to be eaten up by someone's server in a local neighborhood. So in short, firewalls can restrict data coming in as well as going out. And for the most part, it's all done based on these rather arcane port numbers. But you can do this even with your home routers. If you've ever tell, uh, connected to your home router, odds are those of you at home with one of these home routers, you simply want to visit an address of the form HTTP. This is a little small, I realize. Uh, you want to visit an address of the form. 
HTTP colon slash slash most likely 192.168.1.1. That is most likely the address that you can control your own home routers with if you go home tonight. And if you or someone in your household were at least a little bit paranoid, hopefully when you are you will be prompted for a password. And hopefully that password will not be quote unquote password. That password will not be 1234, and that password will not be admin, A-D-M-I-N, which are perhaps the three most popular default passwords that a lot of home routers ship with. And most people do not think or do not know how to change those values. So part of tonight's discussion, of course, is how to secure your own household. It's not enough to have a password if it's the default password that every other Linksys owner has. But with this interface, if you get into your own home router and start poking around the menu options, you'll start to see mentions of things like these protocols. You'll start to see mention of these port numbers and the means by which you can, even in your home network, restrict your own kids' use of the internet by, for instance, prohibiting them from using instant messaging just as though you were the sysadmin at your company. But I'll defer to your specific documentation for your own hardware on how to do that. But it's not too hard. Question over here? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you don't need to be connected to a modem, the internet. Um, you just need to be connected to your browser. An excellent point. Because these home routers are interposed between you and the internet, they essentially can act as a server, among all other things. So in addition to being a router and a firewall and an access point, most home routers are also web servers. And that tends to be their default address. And so if in your computer you connect to that address, assuming you're connected to your home router, even if you don't even own a Comcast or a Verizon connection yet, you'll still be able to access that address, but no other, because you essentially are accessing the only machine in your world that's running an active web server, which is your own home router. And the reason that it's accessed via URLs is just that Linksys and these companies decided that it would be easier if they didn't write special software with which to control these devices, but just leveraged the presence of a web browser on everyone's computer and just made a web interface. It's just meant to be simpler. Other questions? Yeah? Indeed, a firewall ultimately is a piece of software, though as is the case with almost all of the services we've talked about in this course, you can often describe software as hardware. So I can point to a computer on my desk and say, that's my firewall. But if I want to be really correct, I want to say, that is a PC running my firewall. Or that is a piece of hardware made by Linksys that is running a firewall. But in common terms, I mean, even I would just describe things as physical pieces of hardware, even if they do multiple things. It's quite reasonable. A proxy server. Now this picture is a little scarier because there's much more going on. But in addition to being a firewall, most of these home routers, and if you have, are having trouble putting that into perspective, recall if you attended our networking sections, um, we actually had a, um, ours is made by Belkin, I think, this year, a Belkin home router. That's all we're talking about, those little devices that have a switch and so forth built in. Well, among the things they do is they allow a user to share one IP address among multiple computers. That is why your router's IP address tends to be of this form. That is why most of the other computers on your network would have addresses like .2 or .10 or .100. That is because even though all of the IP addresses in the world, even though the world has standardized um, the format in which IP addresses can be. The folks in charge of crafting the IP address standard reserved certain ranges of IP addresses to be only in private networks and to never appear on the internet. Which is to say, that is not a valid IP address for any server in the world. That is only a valid local IP address, a fake internal only IP address. And so almost all of us these days have in home networks whose IP addresses look like this. And this can be problematic because even if you at home are wondering what your IP address is because you need to tell Comcast what it is maybe, well, if you pull up, as we've done many times in class, your little command prompt and type ipconfig, well, you'll get data like this, which we saw in exam one, but many of you will see an IP address of 192.168.1.something. 
That is not helpful for Comcast or most tech support people trying to help you because that is an address that's internal to your network. The rest of the world sees your IP address as something very different. The IP address that Comcast gave to you or Verizon gave to you. So this is an example of what we call a proxy server. Just as in the world of, say, voting, where some, you might vote by proxy, which means you might mail in a piece of paper with your vote on it. Or in some context, you might tell someone what, how to vote, and then they go vote in your stead. Well, that person is acting as a proxy for you. Similarly, in the world of IT, does a proxy server do something on your behalf? Insofar as these devices are designed to share one IP address among multiple computers, the role for a proxy seems quite clear. That home router is serving for your computer and any other computer in your home is a proxy. When you request a web page from your inside your home, you are essentially sending that request to your home router. Then your home router is making that request of, say, CNN. CNN replies not to you, but to your home router. And your home router then forwards the answer to you, thereby truly acting in the most literal sense as a proxy, doing something on your behalf. This picture here, and I'll let you dissect it visually at your leisure, is just sort of a, a complicated example of how this computer here, this Windows 2000 server running NAT, Network Address Translation, is serving as a proxy for all of these other computers. These days, you no longer need to have a separate PC serving as your proxy. You simply buy these $20 or $0 after rebate boxes that do proxying as well as other services. But just a few years ago, this was the picture. And even my first home network with some um, friends of mine after college, we had a Linux PC sitting upstairs in our apartment with a hub connected to it, right? an old school hub. And that Linux box was configured manually to be a firewall, a proxy server, and more. But all of that, hardware, all of that functionality has now been subsumed by these individual cheap devices. But the scenario is in spirit the same. Yeah. So would a router replace those? A router would replace these days these two devices. A router because you most routers have uh, the quote unquote four port switch built in. That's as though your router has these ports inside of it. So what happens these days is that this device merges with that one. But the rest of the picture remains the same. VPNs. Question. Correct. So if IP config is only telling you your internal IP address, how do you find out your actual IP address so far as the external network is concerned? Well, one way is you could connect to your router. And most routers have a screen that will tell you what your actual IP address is. Barring that, frankly, it's Google to the rescue these days. I will go to uh, google.com and type in, what is my IP address? Now, this is not going to be stored on some website statically, right? Because there's not a web page for every one of the billions of users in the world. But recall that any time you visit a site on the internet, what information are you revealing? Your IP address. So all, it's, all that's necessary is that some guy has made up a website that allows us to look up what our IP address is dynamically. And I'll go to this website. My IP address is 140247.44.144. Because I'm on Harvard's network and not using um, a home router, notice that that is, in fact, consistent with what IP config told me. All right, today's lesson of the day is, if ever in doubt, just type your question into Google. And usually, you can actually get responses these days. Good question. Other questions? Well, yeah. Is, is the private IP address limited to what? Say if you're building a network. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
OK, good question. The question is, and you sort of noticed, though I didn't say it, that IP addresses of this form, 192.168.1.something, effectively limit you to a range of IP addresses from dot zero to dot two fifty five, which means your home network can have no more than two hundred fifty six nodes, which is fine for most of us, right? Even the dorkiest among us do not have two hundred fifty six computers in our home. But companies might want to firewall their network and use network address translation. And by that I mean if we haven't used the term before, NAT or network address translation is just one of the features of most proxy servers. It translates your phony IP address into your real IP address and back. Well, how do we have more than, say, 256 addresses? Well, it actually is the case that 192.168 is just one example of private IP addresses. There are others in the world that are reserved for these purposes. And I just Googled for this answer, too, just so we could have a nice little table that I did not create myself. 192.168 is one of the ranges, but there exist other ranges as well. 172.16 allows you ultimately to have networks with uh, 65,000 nodes. And then if you have a class A network, which most people do not have in reality, though MIT is one of the few entities in the world that have their own class A. Not even Harvard has that. Harvard has two or three class Bs. In short, there are other options that allow you many more computers even on a private network. But for most of us, that simply is not, um, not a useful detail that we'll need to use ever. OK, so now VPNs. So a VPN is a virtual private network. Well, how many of you have heard this acronym before, a VPN? All right, of the five of you, what is it? Can we get any kind of answer? Sure. It's like. Uh... It's like a tunnel. One computer to another computer. So if I was to connect to my works address, uh, my work server, mm -hmm. but I need uh, tight security, I would go through my VPN uh, from my house. I would use a VPN client. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, the sensitive information that I'm looking at is not used by others. Perfect. So a virtual private network, as you've said, is a tunnel, essentially, between one network or one computer and another network. This is quite in vogue, for instance, for with companies these days that have um, sales a sales force that travels a lot. You want to be able to keep all of your servers, obviously, secure. You want to keep all of your printers networked, but only isolated to local individuals in the LAN. But when you, your salespeople are on the road, they want to be able to access, for instance, your file server, or your internal database system, or your internal HR system, anything internal to your company. But you don't want to just have them visit, like everyone else in the world, www.mycompany.com and have it glaring there for the whole world to access. Rather, you would like to ensure that if one of your salespeople has a laptop they're using somewhere, and they want to connect to your, revisiting some pictures we've used before, if they are somewhere in the world with a connection to the internet, and your company, meanwhile, is connected to the internet, what a VPN allows you to do is essentially to have a secure tunnel through the internet to your company that is quote unquote encrypted. We've used this term briefly before. To encrypt the data means to scramble it, means to secure it so that no one who intercepts the data can figure out what you mean. And we'll come back to this tonight. So what a VPN does allow you to do effectively is to tunnel across the internet with a secure channel so that you now create the illusion for the salesperson's laptop that they are directly connected to your LAN. Consider, after all, the scenarios we've just discussed. Even in your home network, you have phony IP addresses, internal only IP addresses. But suppose you do want to run a server. For instance, I've showed you in class my Slingbox, that device that streams TV out on the internet. Well, to control that, I need to be able to connect to a box that's in my apartment and behind my firewall. If I want to connect to my TiVo, which is similarly operating these days as a server unto itself, I can't just go to davidmalin.com and then hope that my TiVo is going to show up because my TiVo too is behind my firewall. But I would nonetheless like to be able to get into my apartment, which uh, 
We could now, for instance, depict as something much smaller than this. And to do that, even I, you know, one little person, can establish with my own laptop a VPN into my apartment. Because another one of the features that many home routers offer today is that they act as VPN servers, which means you can connect from your laptop to your own home router in a secure way. And I could theoretically, even from my laptop here tonight, print to my laser printer in my apartment here wirelessly no less. No one else in the world could do that unless they knew how to connect to this VPN with my username and password, but it creates the illusion once connected that I do in fact have a virtual private network, one that's between my laptop and my home network. So companies, to be clear then, will often use this for traveling um, staff members so that they can securely access company resources. And for the user, it's useful because you can securely access your own resources at home if you are so savvy or so determined to. Um, is a VPN different from SFTP? Yes, very much so. SFTP is just a service, in effect a program, that allows you to transfer pro files from one computer to another. A VPN does much more than that. It creates the illusion of connecting a network cable directly from my computer to my LAN. What that means is that I can do anything now over this connection. I could drag files as though we're using Windows or using Mac OS as though I were simply copying them from one folder to another. The VPN creates the illusion that I'm on the same network. I could again print to a printer in my apartment, which I grant is sort of a contrived example, but it sort of speaks to the fact that we are in fact creating an actual connection with the network. So SFTP is a program that lets you transfer files. A VPN is a connection that lets you do anything that you could do if you were actually physically in my home. Yes, and I grant you it's a little strange to be printing from Harvard Hall to my apartment, and I question the usefulness of that feature. But again, it speaks to the fact that we're creating the illusion of my physically being connected to my own computers in my apartment. For the typical user, this is not necessarily a useful feature, because it's rare that most of you probably need to connect to computers within your home. But again, for companies in particular, and even Harvard University and MIT offer their own VPN servers so that if you need to connect to, for instance, servers that are on campus, or you need to have a Harvard IP address to access certain websites. Case in point, Harvard and MIT subscribe to a lot of online encyclopedias and journals and magazines, and the means by which those publications authenticate you and show you resources most of these uh, publications, let's say an encyclopedia, will say, oh, if this user has a Harvard IP address, one that starts with 140.247, they may access this encyclopedia. But now suppose you're off campus or you're traveling some semester. You're still a Harvard affiliate. You want to and you're entitled to access to those resources by VPNing, to use it as a verb, into Harvard's network. What you also get when you have a VPN connection is an IP address from the local network. So my laptop, once connected to my apartment, not only has whatever its actual IP address is, but it gets a second IP address, which is one of those 192.168. So if instead I were connecting via VPN from my laptop to Harvard University, even if I'm well off campus, even in another country, I will then get an IP address like 140.247.something which means if I then proceed to visit websites, those websites will think I'm actually sitting at Harvard as opposed to sitting in my apartment. And that too is a useful feature to create the illusion that you're somewhere that you're not. Questions? Yeah. OK, firewalls. This is like an essay question. Um, um, OK. Yeah. 
Yes. So as of Windows XP, and maybe Windows Me, but I don't remember, Windows comes with its own firewall. So as I said earlier, just as we can call firewalls pieces of hardware, they're really, at the end of the day, pieces of software. And so you can even have on your own local computer a firewall. Norton, um, Ant, uh, Norton Firewall or Norton Security, something like that, is a product made by Symantec, the folks who make Norton Disk Doctor and uh, Antivirus. They make their own version of a firewall. So a firewall is not only something you can buy in the form of a home router. It's also something you can buy in a shrink wrap box and install on your own computer. What it does if you use the built-in Windows one is that Windows by default, if the firewall is on, will not let any programs on your computer access the internet unless you approve them. So the first time you fire up Skype or AOL Instant Messenger, if your Windows firewall is on, Windows will say, uh, you're trying to use Skype. Do you want to permit this action? And you then have to say yes or no. What's really happening is that Windows sees, oh, someone's trying to use port 1234. Do you want to allow port 1234 traffic through the firewall? But they sort of dumb it down to something that's a little more intelligible to most humans. Do you want to let this program use the network? For the most part, software-based firewalls are fine. However, I think there is, in principle, an added comfort and an added layer of security by actually isolating your firewall to a separate box that is physically distinct from the machines you're trying to protect. The reason being, if there's in fact a bug in the software um, in the Windows firewall, it's not good enough that the software is there if it's nonetheless, by some bug, allowing traffic through. And the problem with running to be a little more technical, a software-based firewall on your own computer is that if you have spyware, if you have a worm or some virus installed, almost all Windows users log in as what's called an administrator, which means you have full unfettered access to your computer. You can install software, remove software, and so forth. With that said, if you have some piece of spyware installed or some worm or virus installed, theoretically that virus or worm or spyware is running as though you, the administrator, double-clicked it which means theoretically you could be infected by software that disables your firewall without you knowing it. That is arguably much less likely to happen if you're running one of these hardware-oriented firewalls like a Linksys box, because those are running Linux and rather than Windows, and just there tends to be less, fewer threats on such devices. In short, use this, but also use something else is the best. I think so. That is the design I've taken with every one of my networks, having a separate device. It's worth noting, too, before we take a little, uh, little fun break here, that those of you with wireless routers at home, um, clearly there's a potential issue for security leakage there, because if your data is just zooming through the air, anyone can just read it. Well, most home routers these days offer encryption. Which means if you choose your wireless network, which I'll try doing here, this is what Windows interface looks like. Unfortunately, there's no other access points, wireless routers in proximity to this building, except Harvard Universities. And notice nowhere in that listing is there a mention of a padlock. Well, if I were actually back home, where I live in the city and there's many different people with home routers all in close proximity, I will see many different access points or home routers nearby me. And with those little green bands, it'll, Windows will tell me just how close I am, just how strong the signal is. It's been a funny thing to watch over the past two years that two years ago, I might have eight neighbors with wireless access points and thus internet service I could use. And all of us probably know at least one person who hasn't paid for internet service in a few years because they live so close to someone else who is and someone else who's sharing that unknowingly or otherwise. But over the past couple of years, it's been interesting to watch is all of these unsecured networks have gradually had those padlock icons turned on, which just means that people have turned on security or encryption, which means that if you secure your home network wirelessly, you must type in a password on your laptop before you can access your wireless network. Usually Windows and Mac OS will remember that password, but the point is that new people, strangers off the street or nosy neighbors, unless they know that password, they cannot connect to your home network. And this is important because those of you with home wireless networks, if you have not enabled encryption, it is quite possible that anyone nearby the so-called war drivers who drive by with way too much free time with laptops trying to figure out whose access points are exposed could theoretically sniff 
all of the data on your home network might be pretty innocuous because they could theoretically see files you're transferring among computers, emails that you're sending, instant message conversations, because all of that is just out there. It was just a couple years ago that some guys were um, caught sniffing wireless traffic outside of a Lowe's hardware store, stealing credit card numbers and so forth, because even Lowe's hardware, their sysadmins were not actually sysadmins, but were guys who had set up a wireless network for the store, but had completely failed to secure it. And with no security, it's quite easy to access someone's network, including your own. And I think the most popular offense these days of unsecured wireless networks is just for people to use other people's internet service and not pay for their own. Useful perhaps when you're traveling and you don't have a connection, but you turn on your laptop and you see one nearby. Um, internet cafes like Starbucks and so forth will have unsecured connections, but you'll often have to enter a different type of password to use them. But Harvard has no such password here because they use another form of authentication, which we will come back to in just a bit. But in short, and this was the lesson, even if you do secure your wireless network by turning on one of two protocols, one of which is called WEP, one of which is called WPA, they are protocols that encrypt your data, but both of them are broken. The world has been quite irresponsible when it comes to encrypting wireless networks, and someone with enough time and savvy can hack your network, so to speak, by simply monitoring it long enough. That is to say, even though with WEP and WPA you can encrypt all traffic between your laptop and your home and your wireless router, someone with the right skills and enough time can actually decrypt that data. And that is because both of these protocols have been shown to be flawed. When the world will get around to shipping out better standards remains to be seen, but realize that at this point in the world, wireless networks remain less secure than wired networks, at least within the confines of one's home. With that said, let's take a five minute break. And for those of you who would like to sit in the lecture hall, I will queue up a little something fun that will last those five minutes. In the meantime, the iPod is hopefully still in the room. <laughs> I will queue up another clip on it. And please feel free now to play around with the menu options and the games that might be on it. All right. The task at hand for you before we resume with our chat about security is decrypt this for me. This is a sentence that has been encrypted, scrambled with some cipher. What is the message actually trying to say? I'll give you a 10 minutes. How about uh, um, the O is a B. The first R is an E. Who would like to play meanwhile? One person gets out of the exercise. <laughs> Look closely, there's a clue on this little discus there. Little Orphan Annie is sighted. We're coming up on Christmas, and at Christmas, at least one channel plays a movie every hour on the hour called A Christmas Story. And the Christmas story is a little boy named Ralphie. Well, all he wants is a Red Ryder BB gun. Hey, you wanted hints. I'm <laughs> telling you the story. Oh, at least one of you must have. Little Ralphie throughout the course of this movie, which is in fact a classic, and I do recommend it if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, little Ralphie is collecting little box tops or cereal box tops in hopes of finally decoding the weekly message that Little Orphan Annie has on these cereal boxes. Finally, Little Ralphie <laughs> accumulates enough of these 
box tops or the equivalent, sends in for his Captain Midnight secret decoder ring and decodes one of the most recent messages, which is printed on that product as that, as the incredibly disappointing, most devastating message from Little Orphan Annie, which is, be sure to drink your Ovaltine. Excellent. How did you discover that? Excellent. Oh, well, I wish I, in a better world you would win this iPod for that, but uh, for now you just get to play. How about? Excellent. This does, in fact, say be sure to drink your Ovaltine. The more interesting question, of course, is why? Well, I already told you that the O is a B and the R is an E. Can you bootstrap yourselves from there and figure out what the pattern is? 13 places. So the cipher. The encryption mechanism that I have used here is something that's generally known as ROT13 or Rotate13, which is a specific example of a, C of a cipher generally known as a Caesar cipher, which, as history tells it, was used by Julius Caesar many years ago to encrypt, albeit relatively weakly, messages between his military personnel. The ROT13 cipher is quite simple in that you take every letter in your plain text message, as it's called, and rotate it 13 places. And if you walk off the end of the English alphabet going from Y to Z, you then go back around to A. So you pretty much shift this 26 letter English alphabet by 13 places, thereby rotating the text and creating ciphertext, as it's called, an encrypted message. How do you then decrypt something that has been encrypted with ROT13? Right, unrotate or just rotate 13 more because 13 plus 13 is 26, so it's symmetric, so you just rotate 13 more places. So if you do this at home, the only thing we haven't rotated is the exclamation point. We have rotated all of the actual alphabetical characters. My question now is this is clearly a weak mechanism, right? Even if you didn't know that we were using ROT13, but you had a suspicion we're using something fairly naive like the Caesar cipher. The Caesar cipher in general is exactly this rotational process, but you can have a Caesar cipher with a key of 13 or 12 or 11 or 25 any value from, zero, from 1 to 26, that many places. ROT13 is a specific instance of the Caesar cipher, but clearly not so secure. Because if you knew I were using a Caesar cipher, how much work would you have to do to break this encryption to figure out what the message is? What do you do? Right, try them all, right? Try the key for uh, one, try the key for two, three, four. Finally, you'll try the key for 13 and realize, aha, I have recovered what appears to be what was probably the plain text, an English message. Be sure to drink your Ovaltine. Well, we want to make this more secure. Well, what if we double the cipher? And so we apply ROT13 twice. How much more secure does that make our ciphertext? We encrypt our plain text twice with ROT13. Does it double your security? Encrypting something twice with ROT13. OK, good. So I think of this only because a truly geeky friend of mine years ago used to have as his signature. As some people have these cheesy quotes and whatnot in their signatures. Well, this guy's a security expert. And for a while, he uh, thought it was quite funny to include at the bottom of every email, quote unquote, this email has been uh, doubly encrypted with ROT13 for your security. Which to most people is like, what? But <laughs> to those who understand it, you emit quite the groan, as hopefully you would now too for a gag like that. Well, cryptography is the art of concealing data. So the Caesar cipher and ROT13 are specific uh, techniques by which you can encipher or encrypt data. This is what SSL does. For instance, recall a while ago, we talked about websites whose URL started with HTTPS. We discussed tonight that that really means that the websites are being connected to over port 443. Four, four, Good. 
um, port 443, but what does that mean to be secure? Well, this means if you are connecting with your computer to some web server, say, um, let's say Bank of the Vest.com, and you're using SSL, which means you're connecting via URL of the form HTTPS. Well, we've said for a while now that that means that the connection to the web server is encrypted. Well, hopefully, the encryption being used is a little more advanced than this. And it is, in fact. The technology usually used these days is something called RSA, among others. RSA is essentially a fairly powerful encryption technique that allows you to encrypt data from one point to another. That's a bit of a simplification, but it's much more mathematically advanced than something like ROT13. And the reason for that is that RSA and other encryption techniques that are actually used in the world are based on the hard problem of factoring large numbers. If you've ever heard that a lot of cryptography today is based on prime numbers, the reason is, is that when you use algorithms like RSA, the key, the secret number that you're using is much bigger than 13. Not uncommon today is to use keys that are, for instance, 1024 bits large. What that means, if you are using an encryption technique whose keys are 1024 1, bits long, that means you can have any number of keys from 0 to, to, to the 1,024th power. Now, it's sort of tough to put that into perspective. So let's relate this to something we've already discussed in the course. What is the value 2 to the 32? No, <laughs> not 256. Much bigger. Remember, I said you don't have to remember the exact value, but you should know that it's roughly it's not the 65,536. Roughly 4 billion. Right? Billion. 4 billion is 2 to the 32. Right? The only big numbers you should remember coming out of any computer science class is that this is roughly 4 billion. Uh, 2 to the 24th is in the millions. 2 to the 16th is 65,536. And then finally, 2 to the 8th is 256. And these kinds of numbers have recurred all over the place. The number of colors your monitor displays, now the number of bits used in cryptography. Well, the point here is quite simply this. If you used 32-bit keys for an encryption algorithm, that means your secret number could be any number from 0 to roughly 4 billion. Contrast this with Caesar cipher. The number of keys that the Caesar cipher, or ROT13, allows is any number from 0 to 25, or 1 to 26. So 26 different keys exist in this world. Well, if we used a more complicated cipher that used 32-bit keys, now we have 4 billion keys possible. What does this mean? That means if you're using some encryption standard that uses 32-bit keys, that someone, to crack your code, would have to try up to 4 billion possible keys. Same spirit as you would have done here, but you only had to try up to 26 different keys. Now, if 2 to the 32 is 4 billion, words cannot express, really, how big a number like this is. Because 2 to the 1024 is 2 to the 32 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, times two almost 1,000 times. That's really big. Which is to say that even with the fastest computers today, you are pretty secure using something like RSA or other algorithms that use keys that use many bits. 1024 is increasingly common, but even 128-bit um, keys are quite common with web browsers today. So suffice it to say that when you are inputting your credit card information into a website, assuming per last week's conversation you're connecting not to Bank of the Vest, but bankofthewest.com, and therefore the correct website, no one is really going to be deciphering your data between your laptop or desktop and that server, with some caveats. But for the most part, it's not going to be the encryption that breaks. This is the same kind of encryption that's used in the world of ATM machines. right? The ATM network is necessarily quite secure. 
But the encryption being used is pretty similar to what your own PCs are using with Amazon and so forth. And so the mathematics behind this kind of cryptography, much more complicated than this obviously, but fundamentally based on mathematics. ATMs, if they're going to be compromised, probably not going to be compromised in terms of their encryption. Rather, there are many other techniques with which you can compromise someone's ATM account. Most recently discussed was, and I'll try Googling for the photos, fake ATM reader. Let's see if I can come up with it. So this is on a site about urban legends, but my understanding is that this is in fact true and not an urban legend since we've seen this discussed in the DA's office. Uh, it's a little, the pictures here are a little small, but the top picture here, you have a question. Ordinary looking ATM machine? And these are actual photos of an instance of some uh, illicit activity. If I now scroll down, notice that the police or whoever discovered this, the bank associates, actually found a fake debit card reader fixed to the actual ATM machine. And whoever designed this actually put you know, a few dollars into the design because it's clearly quite nicely matching the original. So this is all to say that we can talk about, and there are entire courses about cryptography and the potential weaknesses of it, things like WEP and WPA being broken. But as I said before, for most people, even broken ciphers are probably fine because the weakness in these systems is likely that you just don't have security turned on on your router in the first place, or your password is uh, taped with a sticky note to your monitor, or someone is simply swiping your debit card number before the encryption even gets involved. So even in the world of finance and banking, you have the same kinds of Achilles heels that you might have in the world of computing, so you really have to consider when it comes to security, the big picture the many different venues in which you can come up with data you shouldn't have. Trashing, like we discussed last week, is an even easier mechanism of obtaining private data that really requires no knowledge even of the complex uh, ciphers that are actually encrypting that data elsewhere. So with that said, actual case apparently. Well, we talked last week too, not only about um, viruses, but also worms and spyware. And we did a couple of live demonstrations of students' machines scanning for spyware and taking a look what was on there. Well, these are just a couple of photographs of what you might buy off the shelf these days, shrink-wrapped boxes, as it were, containing antivirus software. The means by which antivirus software works, of course, is when a new virus is discovered, the folks at Symantec and AVG and McAfee will create what's called a new signature for that virus. They will figure out exactly what pattern of zeros and ones uniquely identifies that new virus, and then they will release via the internet the new so-called virus definitions that you can then download, or your antivirus software should automatically download every day or every night, so that if your computer then sees that virus, the new signature you have installed will, be, uh, will allow your software to detect the new virus and protect you from it. The danger, of course, is that you're still vulnerable to viruses that you have not downloaded updates for. So those of you who have Norton that came with your computer, but you get that message every time you turn your computer on about it having expired, it's not really doing so much anymore. Because you may be protected against thousands of viruses from yesteryear, but you're not protected against today's or tomorrow's viruses without actually having those updates. I put shrink wrap boxes on the screen. But as we discussed last week, very little software do you need to actually buy these days to get you know, a good degree of protection. AVG, which we mentioned last week, free, free updates. I see no reason not to use that as opposed to paying the 20 or 50 bucks that these things cost for most people today. But it does exist. Um, worms, even worse, there exist in the world um, worms that infect entire vulnerable populations in as few as 15 minutes. When you have worms that travel so quickly that they infect every possible computer within 15 minutes, there's no human who at any of these companies has the time or the ability to figure out how to uniquely identify that new worm, update everybody's computer in the world via new virus definitions or worm definitions, and protect you. So this is one of the scary things these days that particularly with worms, the window of time between which uh, viruses or worms are released and the fixes come out is incredibly narrow. 
And it's a scary thing when even if you do keep your computer up to date with the latest antivirus and web software, it, all it takes is a smarter, um, more skilled worm author to circumvent those defenses. And this ultimately is the result of poor design in computers today, that it's so easily, um, they're so easily um, compromised. Well, this sort of begs the question, if we look at, for instance, um, McAfee virus glossary. So you can take a look online at, for instance, the virus glossary. That's, that's not what I want. Virus information, virus hoaxes, virus database. Let's see if we can find the list here. Virus information, virus map, what is a virus, what is a worm? Come on. All right, let's instead go to Symantec. So Symant, here we go. Search for viruses alphabetically. So just to help you appreciate what it means for there to be hundreds or thousands of worms and viruses in existence today, if I click on A, you will see, according to the folks who make Norton, all of the viruses that begin with the letter A today. If we go to B, you will see, obviously, all of the viruses and worms that begin with the letter B today. Many man hours have been spent writing these viruses and worms, and many man hours have been spent writing protections against them. But the short of it is that there are many, many threats out there today. So where are they coming from? Some young guys who don't know what else to do, that um, statistically is actually right on the money. Um, right? These are your um, overzealous 18-year-olds in other countries or our own country or reclusive guys that um, have too much time. And I'm sure there have been many females who have written um, viruses and worms alike. But viruses and worms and spyware all comes from someplace. Unlike the world of biology where mutations can uh, create, introduce to the world new threats, Viruses and worms don't just happen in the world of computers. Someone took the time and made the effort to actually write that virus or worm, and they took the time to figure out how that virus or worm could take advantage of some hole in, say, Windows or some other program. And so these are very targeted attacks these days by folks who are intent on writing malicious software. It does not just happen by chance. Every one of these thousands of viruses and worms listed here has been created by some human being. And some of them, as you've seen in, um, in the news media over the past few years, do cost millions, if not more, dollars in lost productivity, uh, damaged hardware, and so forth. And though most viruses and worms are stupid little things that maybe at most crash your computer, a virus or worm could absolutely format your entire hard drive before you realized it, or corrupt your data before you had a chance to fix it. It could theoretically break your computer by, for instance, um, trying to overclock your CPU. If there were some bug in place on someone's motherboard whereby you could change some of the BIOS settings via Windows, which is possible on some motherboards, theoretically viruses and worms could even make you know, the proverbial smoke come out of your computer and actually break hardware. All it takes is someone with the right savvy and the determination to do so. And then I don't mean to slip back into scare mode because for the most part, <laughs> what folks should be doing today is you should probably be running antivirus software even if you practice safe computing by avoiding attachments and so forth just because there's a little harm in it. And it runs so quickly in the background that it's not really an impediment to doing actual work. But you don't need to pay for it, was my point last week. It's a good question. Are fewer machines being compromised because people are protecting themselves with antivirus software? I would say that fewer infections from previous um, threats are happening because these products only protect you against those products those viruses and worms that the world has already witnessed and thereby crafted defenses for. Even if you are running the latest version of Norton, AVG, or McAfee, you're not protected against the threat that comes out tomorrow. My question was slightly different. So the, the guys and gals who are getting kicked out of this are getting fewer escapes and therefore less of them are being lost because more people are running this stuff. 
uh, are more viruses and worms being launched, be, uh, fewer being launched, because more people are running antivirus or worm software? Possibly, I don't know the statistics, but I don't think the world has seen a notable drop in it such that it's less of a threat. If anything, it's more of a threat these days because you have on the internet what are typically called script kitties. These are perhaps the bigger nuisance on a day-to-day -day basis on the internet because a script kitty is someone who knows how to download a virus or worm and release it but doesn't know how to write it, him or herself. So what you have available on the internet and a little bit of Googling can find you the latest and greatest worms and viruses and worm generators, virus generators. Other smarter people have written the framework with which you can create viruses and worms, posted that to the internet, thereby letting the so-called script kitties, people without programming skills, download those wizards, if you will, and create their own viruses and release them. So the bar has been lowered as to who can create such threats, but really only the most clever of folks out there, the ones with the most spare time, are writing the ones that you end up reading about. But it's a good question. A um, couple final notes on things related here to security before I pose a question or two of the audience. Um, defenses. We talked about at the end of lecture last week the notion of cracking. What does it mean to crack software? Same context as where's, which we also glanced at very quickly. No, I guess I should spend more than 10 seconds on topics next time. So to crack software typically means to remove its copy protection. So most software today has you enter like a CD key, like a number that's printed on the CD case or the box in which you bought the software. Or you have to do what's called product activation, where you enter some personal information, click send, it uploads it to a server, then your product is activated. Well, to crack software typically means to just remove those kinds of protections so that Microsoft never knows that you installed this product or the company that made the game doesn't know that you made multiple copies of it. Same folks that I... The same folks who are doing things in the world of viruses and worms are probably reasonably categorized as the folks who are cracking software as well. Um, how have companies tried to thwart this threat? Well, some companies have tried to create copy protection on the CDs themselves. We discussed last week, though, the means by which you compromise certain Sony CDs by taking your 199 black Sharpie marker, drawing it around the right ring of the disk, no more copy protection. So even the industry makes its mistakes. A lot of software will ask that you activate your software. Again, to crack the software means that they get rid of the screen and they let you use the software um, without entering such information. It's been a big issue, particularly for Microsoft, because there are many companies, Microsoft included, that releases updates for software. And one of the things Microsoft has threatened to do over the years, but has always backed away from it, is for instance, uh, stating or announcing that they will not allow uh, illegal versions of Windows to download the latest updates. Because if you have to connect to Microsoft in order to download the latest updates, that would be their opportunity to say, is this a legitimate copy? Or have I seen that same serial number from someone else? If so, this must be an illegal copy. Microsoft is typically backed down from this for one, concerns over privacy. The privacy enthusiasts do not like the idea that you would be providing Microsoft with information only to get the updates back. There's also an issue of security whereby, and it's sort of a, a bit of a travesty, it's in a sense in the world's best interest if even the illegal versions of Windows be allowed to be updated because otherwise you have more vulnerable hosts on the internet. A lot of the updates that come out of companies like Microsoft and Apple and so forth are security updates that fix security holes in software. Well, if Microsoft were to put its foot down and say the several hundred thousand, millions, who knows, copies of Windows that are illegal on the market cannot access Windows Update and those security updates, well now you've left a very large vulnerable population and that in the aggregate might not be in society's best interest. So it's unfortunate there. And you can read all day long about 
statistics on piracy and how many millions it costs the industry today, how rampant it is in particular countries. China, for instance, are just extraordinary statistics as to what percentage in the, you know, um, 80, I've, I mean, I've heard numbers that are in double digits, uh, over 50% of certain software products being illegally sold. Um, but this is the case too in the world of music, in movies, um, even in the United States here. So it's a serious problem from a commercialistic standpoint um, and most defenses that are in place, including product activation and registration, simply are inadequate because you're always one step behind the smartest bad guy. All it takes is one guy to figure out how to circumvent these kinds of protections, and if he announces that, uh, that uh, uh, if he announces that means by which to circumvent the security, that's all it takes. So it's sort of a losing battle in the end, but one in which Microsoft and the likes have put much money into. This one, for instance, when you install Windows for the first time, Microsoft these days has you activate your copy of Windows, which means that you do transmit to Microsoft information on your computer essentially a summary of what CPU you have, how much RAM you have, what kinds of hardware you have inside of your computer. Microsoft makes a note of that, associates it with whatever serial number or registration number you're using, and if you try to install Windows on another computer using that same serial number or registration number, Microsoft will check that computer's hardware, and if it's not close enough to your original hardware, Windows will say, sorry, you cannot activate this, hardware, this version of Windows on this computer because it seems like you're trying to install it multiple times. This was a big deal for a while, too, because you're disclosing some degree of information to Microsoft. It's a problem if, for instance, your motherboard gets fried and you need to install a new motherboard in your own computer. Windows will often refuse to install on that computer if you've significantly changed your hardware for precisely this reason. The recourse, of course, that you have is typically to call Microsoft. And my understanding is they're pretty good about just via phone reactivating your software because most bad guys would not have the, um, the, the guts or the boldness to call Microsoft and say, hi, can you activate my piece of software for me? So for the most part, the mere act of calling filters out the bad guys and lets little old us who are trying to activate genuine software um, through the phone lines. But it's a hurdle that's in place these days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't affect what is in the Well, it depends. Some software will say you can only install this software some number of times before it will no longer work. Usually, the licensing restrictions will say that you, those three times should be on the same computer. Most licensing agreements say you may not install and use this software on multiple computers at once. But that sort of ticking time bomb is a way of at least discouraging people from even doing that. Because even yeah, if they installed on three computers, at least that's it. They're cut off thereafter. But it depends on the product as to what's allowed. And I apologize, incidentally, it seems our beloved copy place has made this uh, a flip packet whereby it's upside down this week. <laughs> Um, but I turn my attention to problem set six, security, which is often cited by students as, um, I wish I could say the most fun problem sets, but usually words like hard and challenging come to mind. But the reason for this is that this is meant to be a thought-oriented problem set. There really are no right answers to any of the questions on problem set six. Take comfort in the fact that this isn't due until the second week of December. But you'll see as you look this over tonight or in the days to come, that each of these are scenario-oriented questions, and that they ask that you don the proverbial black hat, which means take on the mentality of a bad guy. Put on your bad guy's cap and see if you can propose answers to questions that are ultimately geared around circumventing or ensuring one's privacy and security. For instance, number three, which is a quick one to read. Suppose that some hacker wishes to access the internet on her laptop by way of Harvard's network. However, she hasn't a Harvard ID and therefore cannot register her Ethernet card's MAC address. This is why I said earlier, Harvard doesn't use WEP or WPA. They require that to use Harvard's network, you tell Harvard what your Ethernet address is. Thereafter, they will let you access the network only if they see that, oh, this Ethernet address that they're seeing on the network has been previously registered. 
So the scenario continues accordingly. She cannot simply plug her computer into the network or wander near an access point and obtain an IP address via DHCP since her Ethernet card isn't authorized for a DHCP lease. How might this hacker access the internet on her laptop by way of Harvard's network without having a Harvard ID number? Hopefully the answer won't be immediately obvious, and in fact there is no one right answer, but the point of this problem set ultimately is to get you to think like the bad guy. For one, it's fun to do that sometimes, especially when you're encouraged to do so. Do note, of course, that one question that asks about worms, uh, we do parenthetically note, do not implement your worm. But in thinking also from this more negative perspective, it will hopefully give you an appreciation of the many different ways that even your own machine and your own networks can be compromised. Because even in Harvard's network, and even in MIT's network, and probably even in your company's network, there are ways to circumvent every protection that is in place. If you have enough savvy or cleverness, determination, time, money, whatever your resource happens to be, most security defenses can be circumvented. And this is true in the world of information technology. And these days, this is absolutely true in reality when it comes to airports and so forth. A lot of the times, um, it's people's assumptions that keep things secure. And it's the obscurity of the protections in place that keep things secure. Or in the case of a university, it's the fear of getting caught or getting expelled that is far more effective than any technological solution. And so. For some of the questions we asked you to consider, don't necessarily think about the most technological solutions, but consider and appreciate that even the most obvious, if dirty, approaches like trashing could very much be a viable solution to some problem of security. So with that said, I leave you to tonight's section. And I will see you uh, not next week, but in two weeks. Have a good Thanksgiving. <laughs>